Yo, 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 and welcome back to Creeps and Crimes Podcast. I'm Taylor. I'm Morgan. Happy Thursday and happy episode 189. No, 83. 183. Is it 83 or is it 84? I think it's 89. It's 183. I remember it is on it my notes now. We're back. Um, We're back from Jamaica. We had. We look terrifying, but we have our Jamaica hoodies on. Yep. So cozy. She's so for cute. A picture. So tan. Not me. Wait, not. let me get my shirt up. Ready? Three, two, one. Um, <laughs> I would love to. I can't wait to hear that sound. <laughs> <laughs> We're out of fucking breath. We're exhausted. We're and so, we don't have voices. Gone. And and the pollen came out when we flew back in. Thank God for that. Thank God. I mean, what else would we do? Why wouldn't? Why wouldn't it? <laughs> why wouldn't it? Um. Anyways, we had an amazing time in Jamaica. It was so much fun. Patreon, your pipe and hot goss next Wednesday has all the pipe and hot goss. I might even release it. it early for you guys. Oh yeah, they would like that. Yeah, if you know, if it gets done on time, that's the issue. There'll be a, it'll be a cute little surprise. You guys would yeah. love that, but we'll see. We'll see. But if you want to hear about um, the pink pussy shots, the thirty-two million Miami vices, the island delights, <laughs> the island delights, um, <laughs> the chocolate covered strawberry <laughs> blowjobs. The ch- if you want to hear about the best breakfast of our lives, if you want to hear about how apparently you have to have a, a pole to hold up the tail of the plane or else you're going to teeter totter back and forth and your pilot tells you that. Medical emergency on the plane. <laughs> um, Not us. Me getting absolutely gutted by a, a cane on the. I didn't even tell Patreon also. What? About me whipping that woman with the backpack. <laughs> oh my God. At the gym. Okay, real quick. Real this quick. is the only story and then we're going to keep giving you hands and you'll have to listen to the rest on Patreon. Yeah. Um, we're sitting in patreon.com forward slash creeps and crimes. Period. Period. We're in line to check our luggage. We're like scanning our passports to check our luggage at the Montego Bay right. airport. And I go to get my passport <laughs> out of my backpack. And I just, me and Taylor have just been talking about how I have no <laughs> spatial awareness. Zero. I run into everything. I hit everybody. I like, I'm just like walking. <laughs> like, I, like it's just an empty playing field here yeah and there's nothing that could be in my way i will just barricade right through it i go take my passport out of my backpack i put it back in my backpack they scan you know they scan them i put it back in my backpack and i swing <laughs> my backpack <laughs> around my back to put on my shoulder like she's lassoing it on <laughs> her own body it smacks this woman in the face hard as fuck, hard as fuck. <laughs> i don't know how she continued walking <laughs> like, i would have been she i mean it shocked her i was like I'm so sorry. <laughs> and I and couldn't she look. was like kept walking and just looked back at me like this. <sighs> and I was like, oh my God. She gave devil eyes. Anyway, so if you want to hear more shit like that, the tail on the plane, the cane on the plane. The cane on the plane. Why women kill. Why oh why women kill. If you haven't watched it, go watch it. If you guys are looking to go on a on a vacation to Montego Bay, we ten out of ten recommend going to we went to the we didn't put the name out there until we got back. Um, but it was the Hyatt Zalara at Montego Bay Rose, Rose Hall. Hall. And it was the best all-inclusive resort I've ever been to. I've been to like amazing. four, I think. And this one has been like better than my honeymoon. Yeah. It was that good. And if anybody is planning a bachelorette, bachelor, and they want a wonderful, amazing travel agent who we yep. praise on our hands and knees, this is not a fucking ad. We don't have any affiliation or any sponsorship with these people at all. This None. is not an ad. Please reach out. The instagram is tagged on my pictures i think yours on all pictures it's vacay vibes his name is aaron Mm -hmm. aaron c um tell him morgan and taylor sent you and so we can get some points so that's the only thing we can get out of that is reward points we're trying to get this air tag so (laughs) if even if you're booking a honeymoon or just like a couple's vacay like anything he is absolutely wonderful phenomenal like we didn't have to worry for shit it it really was like so chill the entire time so easy so quick so efficient we just really had a great time with him and if you ever fly into montego bay specifically use club mobay use club get it early because there's only so many tickets per day get it for your arrival and your departure it's worth the fucking extra fifty dollars on arrival thirty dollars on departure is that how much it was yeah, oh, yeah. 33 on departure yeah it was it's it's worth it it's especially worth it. whenever the airport has no air conditioning and club obey does does and, and has free food and dr- well like spoiled you paid for we need it AC. yeah we, we really needed it it was so fucking hot and we had hoodies on and we were also trapped on the plane because they, we had to make sure we didn't teeter totter back and forth yeah so if you want to hear all it. of that please join our patreon link is in the 
bio on Instagram. Everything. It's on the link below this. It's everywhere. You could find it. Search us and forward slash what is it? Creeps for, and, creeps, wait, no. Patreon.com forward slash creeps and crimes. Patreon.com forward slash creeps and crimes. And we're also going to be posting some more of the videos. Th that was just really the best vlog that we had that was like coherent. The other ones were. If, questionable if, do is my dougie gonna make it in the next vlog it has to i think it has to it too. has to make it in and the other video at the end of the night with the concert yeah my ass is out the whole time my titties were out you can see into my vagina yeah so and somehow, we were in front of kids if we could figure that out blur <laughs> Blur. Blur. Immediately. It's such a cute video. It's a, such a cute video. But my ass is out. Um, okay, moving on from that. Are you ready to move on? We're ready to move I on. I want to thank everyone that left, left us reviews and got us are keeping us at this 4.8. <gasps> it yeah. was the best surprise. Every morning we were in Jamaica, we got a new fucking review. So I just want to say um SBC0521, you fucking rock. Ashley Reed, you fucking rock. DJ Mizell, you fucking DJ rock. DJ Colin. Jenny P, you rock. Eve Jam, you rock. Swimmer 1001 you rock M megan freaking jkg blah, 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 blah. i mean elemental p jacqueline crystal taylor j with an e instead of an a ally Ooh, you taylor guys or j. really really fucking rock like Thank you guys so much it made our morning i mean this was so sick i i want to i love seeing these come through so if you haven't left a review on apple yet please go do it we love seeing what you guys have to say you know the rules Five stars only. We'll allow four star if you got a, a, enough beef. If you have beef with us, we'll take but a four star. But if you don't. even try three or below, yeah, we're coming to your house. We're knocking on the front. Door. And also on Spotify, you can give ratings, not reviews. Though, but we love seeing your your guys's like comments and questions come back whenever we like do a question or a poll on Spotify. We have one of our people that works with us. We're not going to tell their your you guys their name or anything but um because they're more private but they are helping us like sift through stuff like that through reviews and spotify and apple and all that yeah, stuff when and you got dms and emails and then spotify's like oh let's open up a forum <laughs> you're like, like oh forum. my god oh my god so we have someone that's doing that and they send us all the ones that come through and let us see them so you guys are fucking cute you guys are so cute More and then ass. moving on we are making a formal apology to the royal family yep we are sure are and that's all that we're gonna say and about that's all that, that we're gonna say about that moving on um the bridge the bridge oh my yeah God. So, everyone in maryland oh my lord baltimore so today is march 26th mm -hmm. and i woke up for work I, you know, I get up for work at 4 45 in the mm -hmm. morning and immediately i had a twitter what's it called x notification yeah. on my phone and it was like you know mass casualty event, like i was like baltimore. Event, baltimore maryland i was like what the fuck is going on open up my phone and i just sat there in my bed like holy shit i've never seen anything like that in my life it is so terrible so sad it it was so a scary failure like that is the scariest thing and what was crazy is i i woke up this morning to my alarm just turned my alarm off didn't grab my phone grab the remote turn on the news so i could hear that really mm -hmm. loud and wake up and the first thing that pops up they're showing the footage of it and i really thought that we were under attack when yeah. i first saw it like that's how fucking sick it made me but then they like you know went on but i was shaking logan awake i was like wake the fuck up yeah so, uh, this is so i've been so worried about all of our baltimore listeners and friends that we have today so we're sending you guys a prayer because that is just i mean how how terrible tragic I mean, that is tragic oh um, one of my biggest fears i'm so one thankful that it was at 1 30 in the morning and not at like right, rush, rush hour, hour because so many more lives would have been lost and though we still don't have a full count at right. this point because of just how bad the damage is yeah so by the time this comes out i'm sure that there will be more information out on it but at this point it's the morning just, that it happened i mean it made my stomach drop i can't and i i've been that kind of person today where i'm constantly looking at it me too i'm constantly watching ever the video over and over again i'm like why am i doing this because I, I like really am having to watch every like where you see the power turn on and turn back off again and when they try to manually do it they're blowing up that seam yeah. trying to get the thing back like you can see there's an effort to try and mm -hmm. i don't know maybe it's just because of the fucking tiktok videos of the what's that movie what, that we just watched oh, with julia um, roberts Oh, the the Obamas. The Obamas production one that we talked about. Leave the world behind. Leave the world behind. Like that cargo ship. Yeah. Maybe it's just because of that movie. Right. It just makes me ill. <laughs> um, what are you the CEO of? Um, this week I am the CEO of being a mother frickin' bride. Ting. 
I'm the CEO so, of not the Arabesque. Bean Tan. <laughs> For the first time in years and can't shut the fuck up about it. I haven't been naturally tanned in so long. I don't want it to ever stop. That's why we needed like another week there just to tan. Yeah, like truly though. I and no, we would have fried. But let's I talk was, about how good I am we did. Disintegrated. We only got burnt the last day because we're like, it's the last day, it's cloudy. It'll mm-hmm. be fine. We've got a base burn. Guys, we had seventy to a hundred on us the entire time. We did not fucking slip up once. We That's were a lie. What? We lost oh, our seventy, we lost our 70 for the a day. first day. Yeah. And we got burnt on that, but we kept 50 and 30 like regularly yeah. coming on. Like we weren't fucking up. It was just that we were missing spots because we were all, we didn't have the spray, so we were having to rub it in. Yeah. And so there would be like a big gap that someone got burnt. Like Sarah had this one strip on her arm. My ass got, cheeks are fried. Fried. So the last day we didn't have a 70 and we, or we only put 70 on once and it was cloudy. So we're like, oh, we're good. We're fine. No. We'll be in the cabana. We'll be in the cabana. It'll we'll be, be at okay. the bar drinking pink pussies. pink pussy shots in the shade. It's fine. No. I will never forget that one guy who said to me, Oh, you must be the Irish friend of the group. I said, I'm sorry. Sir? I said, What does that mean? Like, I was so offended. He was like, Honey, you need to go put some sunscreen on. <laughs> I was like, Oh my God. Oh my God. When Rude? He, when he walked by her, touched her shoulder, Hey, honey. You need to go put some sunscreen. You need on. to reapply. I'm like, we just put it back on her. I, was like, I just put some on. We literally just put five it on. minutes ago. We were on top of it. We had a fuck. We had a noodle with us, and noodles a fucking Skin militant, militant, leader. militant sunscreen girly. And she would come over to us like she was our mom and spray us yeah. if it looked like. I mean, we were on it. We were on it. I only got burned that one day, and then I was Gucci. Yeah, I'm. My face is real fried, dry. But and I don't know if that's just from the chemicals and the salt water. I think and it has then, a lot to do with it because whatever yeah. the pool whatever they had in the pool i mean it took my spray tan off in an hour in an hour it disintegrated my toenail polish off to my completion. toes like totally and i'm broken out in like my chest my back like and my boil chin. acne everywhere i don't have breakouts so no. I, they're everywhere my neck my ears my chest my back my face my yeah crazy yeah we we i'm like oh perfect right before my wedding let me get that great cleared up yeah never you, had a break out of my life you need to go literally lay by the pool i need to go lay out in the sun you're right yeah lay on the sun okay let's uh get into it if you're driving throw that shit on cruise control if you got a glass pour that shit up and let's get creepy Okay, Morgan, what do you have for us today? Well, today I am going to be covering Rose Hall in Montego Bay. Oh, shit. It's only fucking fitting. It's right? only fucking fitting. It's only fucking fitting. So before we start, we did not make our way over there because no. we were being safe travel girlies and mm-hmm. we weren't leaving the resort. We didn't we have the being, boys with us. We, we didn't being, feel safe. We were being cautious girlies. Even though I felt so safe the entire time we were there. It I was felt just, like I could have went out and drove around for nine Yeah, hours. we really were like, we feel so safe. This is like anybody that ever was like, you shouldn't go to Jamaica. Y'all are fucking crazy. The people are amazing. amazing. The culture is even better than you could ever like fucking imagine in your head. Foods, the best food you've ever had in your fucking life. People are so kind. It's just when you're traveling with eight girls, you kind of put a target on your back. So. Yeah, you do. A big one, especially when you're taking pink pussies. Yeah, when you're taking pink pussies all the time. All right. So Rose Hall is one of Jamaica's most famous houses, and it has a very, very interesting story. Mm-hmm. It sits in Monte- Montego Bay. <laughs> what? <laughs> it sits in Montego Bay and has views overlooking you know, the ocean, but specifically the Hyatt Zalara Ziva Rose Hall yes. resort, meaning they were just watching us take 14 pink pussy shots this weekend. Thank God. But of course, it. why would I be covering it if it didn't have some daunting and haunting history? So Rose Hall is haunted by its former mistress of the house, known as the White Witch, Annie Palmer, who lived, or should I say, ruled the plantation and its inhabitants. So I, the majority, all of this case is talking about the mistreatment and the abuse of the enslaved people on this plantation. So if you want to bypass that. Trigger warning. Giant trigger warning. If you want to skip ahead, probably, I don't know, 20 minutes, 25 minutes to skip out on this. Um, I'm not prepared to hear this after all the pink pussy shots that we took. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. I was writing these notes and I was like, 
We should have Googled this before. <laughs> well, actually, I think you'll be surprised at the end. I got a little okay. twist to the okay. story. I'm, I'm, I'm terrified. <laughs> so Annie was born in England in 1802 to an English mother and an Irish father. Their family moved to Haiti when Annie was 10 years old, and her parents ended up dying shortly after from yellow fever. Like, I think it was like a year later, to, oh, a year shit. or two later. And her nanny at the time, who was a voodoo priestess raised and taught annie in the black arts right and this was her nanny for like a long time and once her parents died she took over as annie's mother figure right after her nanny's death annie had moved sorry nanny and annie it's a lot of annie yeah, annie annie after her nanny's death annie had moved to jamaica and searched for a wealthy husband and she might have been 17 or 18 at this time and what year would have this been sorry um is 1820 okay 1820 i had to do math here. Right. she was born 1802 and this is 18 she was 18 years old so yeah. 1820 yeah with her black arts practicing she met and cast a allegedly met and cast a spell on the owner of the rose hall estate john palmer to trap him into a marriage got it so their marriage from the get-go slay bitch <laughs> was a little bit of a setup she said i'm gonna go find me a rich husband and, and i like the biggest largest house on this island i you're will take coming him. home with me yeah making potions in the backyard my name is john palmer i would love to marry you and you're like you just immediately become have you seen those tiktoks where it's like when he's like what are you doing the night before or he's like he he says good morning cutie meanwhile this was me the night before mixing potions like, <laughs> no swear to god yeah i've seen those big dogs it's funny as fuck okay uh lost my spot sorry guys you're gonna hear something go in my mouth my throat hurts so bad i keep having to put these hard candies in my mouth to make me uh shut the fuck up so i'll be able to tell my kids all right so annie marries john palmer making her annie palmer and she becomes the second mistress on this plantation that was once and still is by many regarded as the finest, most like prominent great house on the island of Jamaica. It's stunning. It is gorgeous. The house had 365 windows, one for each day of the year, 52 doors, one for each week of the year, 12 staircases, one for each month of the year. I love it. That. <laughs> that is insane. That is insane. Um, little did John know before he married Annie um, he not only married a woman after, clearly after his money, the gold digger, but he married someone who was a sadistic, psychopathic, deranged, heartless killer. Oh, great. Annie was bat shit. Mm -hmm. Control was Annie's name and pain was her game. I hate that for everyone involved. Everyone involved. If there was ever happiness in their marriage, it was not publicized. It was never document documented because shortly after they had settled down, um, Annie killed John. Oh, fuck. She poisoned him in order to gain complete control over the plantation, which also included making several enslaved and freed Jamaican men her little sex toys. No. Yeah. No. Yeah, she did that. Oh so my god! So she poisons him, and she is like, "Everybody that's on this plantation is now mine, for my pleasure, for my entertainment, for my enjoyment." She's very fucked up. Does she even know how to fucking run it? No. Clearly, she's like, "No, she has no idea." Y'all are here for my enjoyment, no bitch. After this, after she kills her first husband, um, she obviously gets control of the plantation, and she marries. She will go on to marry two more men. And kill them as well, both over a nine-year span. Two more. Yes. Every bedroom in the home, minus one, she had killed a husband in. Oh, my God, girl. She was so just swapping bedrooms. bedrooms. She's like, I mean, like, we could do, like, primary bedroom one, and then kills that husband in there. And she's like, let's move over to this primary my bedroom. My ex-husband died in this room. It was tragic. It was so tragic. We have to move to the next room. Come on, lover. We'll get this renovated to be the primary room. Yeah. So her second husband that she killed, she stabbed him to death. Oh, my God. And the third husband was strangled to death by herself and one of her lovers who was enslaved, then freed by Annie to be her lover. And his name was um, Taku. Taku. It's T-A-K-O-O. -O. Not only did she love watching her husbands die, she also enjoyed observing those that were enslaved suffer 
from the brutal beatings by the people that work at the plantation. Mm. She would sit on the balcony of the second floor at the back side of the house and would just drink her tea, her coffee, and like be laughing and like in enjoyment of watching them strip these men, women, children down, whipping them. Extremely fucked up. She is... Yeah. Her fucking hand is broken. Yeah. One thing that Annie did that has stuck throughout history and has been carried down legend, story after story, legend after legend, is that she ordered bear traps from other countries to use for her runaways. No, Morgan, no. Jamaica had no bears. There's no bears. Meaning she was importing bear traps and setting them up on the outsides of the property to capture any runaway. Bear traps. And her sole purpose for these traps was obviously torture. Torture. Pain. And like, what the fuck? You just rolled up to Jamaica yep. and enslaved their own fucking people. And you're not even fucking from here, bitch. Yeah, not even fucking from You're not here. even fucking from, from here. You're literally from England. You lived in Haiti for what? five years your life yeah she she ordered her so i guess they called them overseers yeah so like the people that ran the plantation for mm-hmm. her like i don't know what to call that yeah I, I think yeah i don't know what the term the proper term is I, me, overseers me is like what i've Heard. read in history books me too okay so she would order them to like any known like runaway location point like so obviously like they knew that we could get out this way or right. we could escape this way. Any known runaway location point was loaded with bear traps. Whoa. Oh, my God. This and is terrible. Yes. She would sit up on her ledge, her balcony. I thank God we didn't go and, here, honestly. And, like, all day, all night. And when she heard the screams of somebody being trapped in a bear trap, she would then take a group of the enslaved people, take them over there, and sit there and watch as that person's leg is literally in a bear trap. And you have to like rip. I don't even want to talk about it. And she would leave that. She would either leave them there to bleed Bleed to death. Or she would take them down into their dungeon. So she had like, and it's an outdoor entrance. I'll talk about it a little more here. She would either take them back to their dungeon. And when she said they quote, had no more legs because they were useless to her. And they were, there was like jail cells in the dungeon. And she would just lock them up and starve them. Until they died. Dehydrate. Yeah. Until they died. Whoa. Thank God, Morgan, we did not go here. I thought it was just about a witch that lived there. Not this this bitch. Not yeah. this white bitch. Yeah. White bitch. The white bitch. of The Rizal. white bitch. Yeah. So many of the enslaved on the plantation died at the hands and the abuse by this sick and twisted white bitch. White bitch. Getting rid of her deceased and murdered enslaved was not an issue and at the time would not bring up any questioning by the locals because owners, especially wealthy ones, were above the law. Right. But no one batted an eye at the right. actions and the decision. And I'm guessing this is when they were under like English or British control. Yeah. I'm not sure that timeline. Yeah. I, I don't know what the time. Up. I mean, I, I know it was in the 1800s. Yeah. Because that's when a lot of people moved over there from England. Yeah. Um. But ridding, getting rid of her husband's dead bodies was a completely different yeah, scenario. Yeah, that's a whole different fucking thing. Scenario, scenario. Scenario. But it was one that she well thought out. So again, the home had this secret door that led to her dungeon, which also was home to the jail cells for those that she delegged. And this route down here underneath her house allowed her enslaved people to easily dispose of the bodies of her husband's she got rid of all of their bodies due to the fact that it led directly to the ocean. Whoa. Yeah. So yellow fever was the epidemic at the time. And on everybody's death certificate, all three husbands, they died of yellow fever. No. Oh, my God. And Annie was just like, well, they had the disease. So I had to dispose of them properly. Oh, whoa. No one batted an eye. Three men. I guess no one But gave the locals f- knew. Also. I mean, yeah, because literally they're like having the fucking take bodies on them they're seeing the bodies right um so taku who is the enslaved man that she freed to be her lover and the one who helped strangle her third husband would actually bring annie's death Mm. once taku had been freed he would visit her bedroom nightly and was by all accounts very loyal to annie Mm -hmm. until she crossed the line okay 
Taku had a granddaughter named Millicent. And one of Annie's plantation accountants, which I don't fucking know what a plantation accountant is. What the fuck? I'm an accountant. I'm sure. Whatever yeah, you are. What the hell? Um, his name was Robert Rutherford. And Robert had the hots for Millicent. Okay. Which is Taku's granddaughter. Oh, God. And he had a huge crush on her. Well, this wouldn't be a problem if Annie didn't have a crush on Robert Rutherford. No. Who was head over heels for Millicent. Oh, not no. Not Annie. It was a huge, giant little love triangle that was did not even involve Annie. Yeah, at all. At all. She implemented but she herself. she inputted herself into this love, yeah. love triangle. But in Annie's eyes, this was a problem because he was a white worker on her plantation and he loved an enslaved woman. Oh, Millicent. yeah. And so she was an enslaved Jamaican woman. Yes. Oh, wow. So one day, Annie made an advancement towards robert rutherford and she was denied because one he loved millicent and two nobody really wanted to fuck annie they yeah. were do they were next to die yeah if, if they you, were to if fuck you annie. fucked annie you're dead you're dead yeah don't fuck the white bitch fuck the white bitch Get, you're dead yeah you're dead um and this rejection made <laughs> that was too far <laughs> i mean that's what happened um and this rejection made annie extremely pissed off so pissed off that she murdered in cold blood Taku's granddaughter, Taku, her lover's granddaughter, Millicent. No. Because Robert Rutherford, who Millicent had also like no idea that he even loved her. Yeah, this has nothing like, to do with her. This was just like I've been watching her and like she's beautiful. Like I have the mm. hots for her. We should kill him instead. Yeah, because he was probably a creep. Yeah. Yeah. And um, she went and she murdered her lover's granddaughter. Yeah, you cross the fucking line. And you, you cross the fucking line. Taku yeah. is furious. He's yeah. pissed. His love for his family was far greater than his affair with Annie and the murder that they shared together of her third husband, and he wanted revenge. Annie murdered Millicent out of jealousy and to avenge her death. Taku made love to Annie one final time and then strangled her in her bed. I mean, I'm not saying there is two versions to Annie Palmer's death. The one where Taku strangles her and the second where the enslaved people take over the plantation and push her off the very balcony that she watched them being beat day in and day out. I mean, if he had this whole plan and he was like, I'm going to start choking her when I get her down, y'all fucking rush up here. Not that anyone's murder is I'm just saying that this one's a little bit... Oh, she yeah, was going to be hung mean. at the fucking stake. She was a witch. She murdered three husbands. Yeah. So she was going to die either way. So the community as a whole is like filled with joy. Like local. Like and everybody is like, holy shit, Annie's dead. Right. The white witch is dead. Um, so she was originally buried at a site that was five miles up the road from Rose Hall. But later on in like, I guess like 1990 maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know the exact date. They did DNA testing and they confirmed that this was her grave site and the body that was buried five miles away. And they transferred her back to Rose Hall Plantation site and placed her in a tomb. In a tomb? Yeah. That bitch deserved a tomb? A tomb. I mean, you know what? If that's what the justice that the locals and descendants of these individuals wanted so that they could have a place to go fucking condemn someone to hell. Well, and I also think they knew that there are so many spirits on this land and they were like, we want them to to be able to fuck her ass up. So once they move her back to Rose Hall and place her in this tomb, they performed, I'm assuming the locals performed a voodoo ritual in order to keep her spirit in this place. When it was time for the ritual to begin, the voodoo priestess recognized that her spirit was not in the tomb and it was roaming. No. Oh. Which led to an unsuccessful return back to where she needed to lay to rest. Yeah. And therefore, her spirit to this day roams freely, meaning she was probably standing right next to us drinking a Miami Vice. No. Cause she's Annie, not you're not invited to the girls' club. Annie, you were not invited to the pool bar. No, Annie, you're not allowed to fuck with us at all. There is no living portrait of her that exists mm. to see what she looks like. But some people think, so there's one painting in the walls. It's this very petite woman. She's dressed in red. And a lot of people think that it is made to represent Annie. This is because she loved the color red. It was the color of blood. And that was her fucking color. Yep. And though she never had any children, she supposedly had this portrait painted to convince people that she was the motherly type. 
<laughs> but this couldn't be further from the truth. People say that if you find yourself walking beneath the painting, you'll notice that Annie's eyes follow you as you move. But, no. Because she's always keeping watch on everything in the house. So I'm going to show you this picture, Taylor. Okay. And a lot of people get freaked out by the kids in it because they look super stiff, doll-like, like as if she was standing there with actual, like sh no one knows who these kids are. What She fuck? never had children. It's like just eerie. I don't like her eyes. Yeah. Well, they, they follow you. And she's like, she's got, we'll post this picture. She's got one like up on her. She's got holding like one up kids. on her hip. But yeah, there's one, two, three, four, five kids and a dog in this. In She's this got painting. fucking a whole squad out that here. That is supposed to be representing her. As being motherly. <laughs> so after her death, she began to make these like ghostly appearances around Rose Hall. She was driving servants, guests, and residents mad mm -hmm. with like just terror. Like she was just terrorizing them. But before long, the house was abandoned and fell into ruin because no one but Annie could ever be the mistress of Rose Hall. There was one family who did try to live at Rose Hall in the early 1900s after the Palmers had abandoned it mm -hmm. or after it was abandoned after Annie's death. But they were driven from the place when their maid was thrown from the second story balcony by, quote, an invisible set of hands. The same balcony that Annie would sit and watch the enslaved people be tortured. I love that they were like, we're getting the fuck out. Yeah, they're like, we're out. Fuck we're getting this. the fuck out. That's crazy. After the death of the maid on the balcony, the new family fled Rose Hall and it remained abandoned up until the 1960s when it was then cleaned up, restored and revived for public use as this historic house and plantation. But what if I was to tell you that this entire story that I just told you is all rumor? Oh, there is no actual proof that Annie did any of this. So here is the historical version and what many historians believe to be the factual story of Annie Palmer. This is according to the Association of Paranormal Study. In 1746, there was a man named Henry Fanning who purchased a 290-acre plot of land in Jamaica to prepare for his marriage to a woman named Rosa Kelly. They were then married a year later in 1747. But Henry Fanning died a few months after their marriage, after their wedding. Therefore, Rosa Kelly owned everything, the 290-acre plot of land. But yet, on this plot of land, there is no Rose Hall. This is just land that they right. owned. In 1750, so three years after her husband's death, Rosa marries again to a man named George Ash, who then built Rose Hall officially. While some th people think that Rose Hall was named for Rosa, um, George was close with the Rose family that just lived down the street, a mm. very wealthy family. So a lot of people speculate that they gave him the funds to build this home. And so they named it Rose Hall. And so they named it Rose Hall. Got it. Or something else was going on there that he, somehow he got the f business deal on. I don't know. Yeah. In 1752, George died just after Rose Hall was completed. So this is Rosa now on her second husband. Yeah. <laughs> a year later, Rosa marries another man, a man named Norwood Witter. He ended up spending all of Rosa's money and left her in debt and died in 1767. I would literally So now that's him. three husbands that Rosa has had passed. Mm -hmm. Any 10 year radius right. span. In 1768, Rosa married a man named John Palmer who was from a neighboring estate. John and Rosa both died shortly after their marriage. Like they were only married for a couple of years. And because the two of them had no children, the estate was left to John's grandnephew, John Rose Palmer, who took over the estate in 1818, and he marries a Jamaican woman of Scottish descent named Annie Mary Patterson, a.k.a. now Annie, Annie Palmer. Palmer. So they marry in 1820, and he was her only husband. This is like what the historians say. Annie marries John Palmer, only husband. Neither Annie or John died at Rose Hall. In fact, they couldn't handle the debts that were passed down from his uncle, great uncle, um, and so they couldn't afford Rose Hall and they eventually had to abandon it. When they were at Rose Hall, they only had one or two enslaved people. And after they lost Rose Hall to debt, they lost their enslaved people too. Right. John ends up dying in 1827 and Annie sold what was left of their estate for about 200 pounds, which I think that's what that wow. symbol is. She then passes away in 1846 around her mid 40s. And the two of them were only married for about seven years. The rumors of the White Witch came from a newspaper clipping from 1868 that actually labeled Rosa Palmer 
as the White Witch of Rose Hall. Mm. So this is like generations so way before So she would Annie. have been the the white bitch. Yeah. Um, which honestly makes a lot more sense, especially given the number of marriages that she historically had that is yeah. documented. Yeah, and we do know that it was operating. Right. Yeah. Then in 1911, another story came out about the White Witch, only this time it labeled Annie with the title. Because she was the last one. In 1929, um, a man named Herbert D. Lizer wrote a book called The White Witch of Rose Hall with Annie once again labeled as the White Witch. And this book was meant to be fiction. Like this whole story was meant to be fiction, but it soon became reality, which is a perfect example of how fiction and facts can mold into something completely different from the true story. And this is how legends and rumors are born. Right. So nobody knows like the true story so this is has now just been legend since like the early 1900s that this yeah. annie palmer did this this and this well, if that's not annie well and that's what i was about to say like like how sorry okay annie if that wasn't you we so apologize yeah if it's rosa you're the white bitch you're the white bitch but because like, there had to be but, some sort of a horrific person that but, did offer but what it. did they do still they did dna testing and they moved annie palmer back to that site when she didn't even die there Oh, God. And that's why she would have been five miles. Yeah. So No wonder they can't find her soul. She's like, I'm literally not there. Yeah, she's like, I don't want to be here. I'm I crossed the over fuck here. over. So I don't know where, like, the legend got mixed. I mean, I guess we do from these articles, but... I just think it was like this story that was being told and like rumors being spread down. I think down. yeah, just a game names of telephone got mixed over, up. Yeah, a game of telephone over two hundred years. Yeah, like I, I'm not. Gonna, I don't want to discount at all like any of the enslaved people's stories that they had an experience while being enslaved right. at Rose Hall. Right. But if it was not Annie and we just fucking called her a white bitch, and it was actually yeah. Rosa because like that's. Yeah. So sad. It is sad. And it's sad for Annie's soul and spirit. Like if that's she's, like if they so, literally yeah, moved so her back. For her. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so. if they did this DNA testing and they determined that it was not Annie Palmer, then no one checked with the fucking historic society. I don't know. Well, I mean, I'm assuming they just did. I hope that they did not move Annie. Yeah, but good I think Annie it's Palmer's. Just, I think it's also, though, like that could be a barn of the fucking lore, too. I think it's also just like a tourist trap, though. Yeah. Like they moved her back because the story is that it was Annie Palmer. And that's why they did it. Yeah. I really, I hate it. All, I know. All, all sides around, of it. I, I hate, hate it. it. So the best part about Rose Hall and what's really interesting is that Johnny Cash and his wife, June Carter Cash, lived at Rose Hall. Oh, my God. They bought the house in the early 70s from John Rollins and owned it until the Rollins family bought it back in 2012 after the, both of the Cashes passed away. And Johnny Cash did have a paranormal experience while there. Hmm. He said that once um, they were hosting a dinner party one evening and he saw this apparition of a woman in white. She was in her 30s and she just was walking from the dining room towards the kitchen. And he even went on to write a song about Miss Annie Palmer. Oh, God. So I'll read you the lyrics. On the island of Jamaica, quite a long time ago, at Rose Hall Plantation, where the ocean breezes blow, lived a girl named Annie Palmer, the mistress of the place, and the enslaved all lived in fear to see a frown on Annie's face. Where's your husband, Annie? Where's number two and three? Are they sleeping beneath the palms beside the Caribbean Sea? At night, I hear you riding, and I hear your lover's call, and I still can feel your presence around the great house at Rose Hall. Well, if you should ever go to see the great house at Rose Hall, there's expensive chairs in China and great paintings on the wall. They'll show you any sitting room and the whipping posts outside, but they won't let you see the room where Annie's husbands died. Mm. So like that's where I, that's where I don't know where to like. I mean, he's also like abetting this whole like thing. Well, yeah, because he is aiding that's and abetting a story that he's been told. Right. And I'm sure it's a story that every locals b believe yeah. and, and it might be the true story we have no idea we have no idea we were too scared to ask about it we just heard that there was a white witch we yeah. don't want to be anywhere well, near and her even if you go on like rose hall's website it does say like annie palmer and it, it does so it recognize be, annie it could be either yeah and who are we to say yeah we don't fucking know if the story is true crazy fucking crazy bitch. Fucking whoever you bitch. are yeah well, yeah. Yeah. So, 
Anyway, yeah, that is my case on Rose Hall Plantation in Montego Bay, Jamaica. Thank you for that, Morgan. But no, thank you. At the same time, <laughs> all right, my turn. Your turn. So the case I have for you today, t- t- today, tonight, tonight. Thank you, Knoxville. <laughs> thank you, Knoxville. Okay, my worst accent ever. I've got a DB Cooper like case for you. Mm. Okay, and I Can't just wait. am shook that I had never fucking heard of this case before because I wanted to cover something like D.B. Cooper because I know my case that I gave you guys last week was fucking hard. It was hard, and this one's still sad, and there are going to be discussions of suicide throughout it at, at very different, like, various different locations, but I will give you a trigger warning for those. But other than that, like, it's really more of just, like, a D.B. Cooper case. Okay. All right. So let's jump into it. This is a case of Albert uh, Albert Einstein. No, <laughs> Albert Lowenstein. Okay, okay, not Albert. I know that last it's name. It's definitely it's definitely not it's Albert. De- it's Devery. <laughs> no, I am. It's definitely not him. Edit. It's Alfred. Alfred Lowenstein. I keep calling him Albert though. I typed it like nine. Oh, times. it's not even Albert. No, it's <laughs> Alfred. Alfred. Okay, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I kept typing it too. Okay, Alfred Lowenstein was born on March 11th, 1877 in Brussels, Belgium to Bernard Lowenstein, who was a German Jewish banker. And then his mother, I don't know what her name is, but her she was the daughter of a Brussels stockbroker that was named Christian, no, Kristen Dansert. Dansert. Now, we don't know much about Alfred's life growing up, but what we do know is that he was born into this very prominent family like both his mother and his father came from big time banking financial people and by his 20th birthday he had entered the financial world and became became this like tycoon type of dude he quickly became this powerhouse and really made a name for himself like put his family the Lowensteins on the map and in 1908 he married a woman named Madeline Masson on all accounts an absolutely fucking stunning woman. She came from a very prominent Belgium family. Okay. And eventually they had one son together. Alfred Lowenstein primarily made his fortune by selling stock in a Brazilian infrastructure company in Belgium, France, and England. And by 1914, he became one of the top three richest men in the... What? It just sounded like a location, Belgium, France, England. I know, and then I was like, let me let me go back, <laughs> let me go back and separate that. But- I love that town, Belgium, France, England. <laughs> Belgium, France, England. That shit, I love it. That's my favorite town ever. I can't oh god. So, um, by 1914, he became one of the top three richest men in the entire world. Holy shit! Yeah, in 1914, by investing in electric power and artificial silk. Which was like up and coming at the time. No one would like move money into it. And he was like, um, I will. I see it. These Let's are the go. best snaps I've ever done in my life. Right. Those are the best snaps you ever have done. Never once in a DG meeting did I ever hear that. Was, that was. Usually it's like this. Wait. Usually I snap like this. Logan doesn't know how to snap. And it like really is the bane of his own existence. Like he I can't d- handle it. I can't either. My fingers pop out of my sockets. Oh, okay. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> like I have to pop back. Literally up. popped up against her head right then and there. <laughs> um, by the mid 1920s, he was so powerful that he was actually consulted by heads of the state from around the globe. And the British government made him a companion of the most honorable order of bath of the bath. Why didn't Annie Palmer marry him? Literally, literally. She didn't need to. He didn't need to be killed. He was a cool cool dude, I guess. In 1926, Lowenstein established the International Holdings and Investments uh, Limited. Holy shit. Which raised huge amounts of capital from wealthy investors wishing to get, like, a on this bandwagon of success with him so it was kind of like almost like an mlm but like it was actually but he was like he basically he created holdings. yeah exactly he is the wolf of the world at yeah. this point for which he had two other like main investors that he ran this company with which i'll come back to later however though lowenstein had this like m- he was considered this financial massive powerhouse dude he was regarded as being a weird dude like they called him eccentric, you know, and okay, when I see like that oddball, yeah, he's just a little bit of an oddball. And an example of this would kind of be his marriage with Madeline, 
It seemed as if their relationship like to the outside was totally fine, but truly it was more about status and convenience for the both of them than anything else. Basically, like Alfred Lowenstein wanted a gorgeous wife who could attend parties, host parties and show up for that level of society and was kind of like built for it because mm-hmm. you I, I don't think I I think I could turn it on if I needed to. But like I need to send my Pedro Pascal Pascal shirt. I walked in the door from the airport and I took all my clothes off and laid on the floor. Like he wouldn't like me a wife as a wife. Yeah, he not. needed someone that was like attuned I, to his. I walked in. I opened up both my suitcases in the middle of the living room yep. just to give Aaron his clothes and to get lotion out for my face. And then they're still there three days later. Yeah, my he uh, probably wouldn't like that. My either. Delta zip tie is still on <laughs> mine, unopened. Not good, not good. Yeah, he would not like that from us. We would not be. I would love to live that life, not for me. Anyways, uh, just one that knew that world, and honestly, like most of all, that would just leave him the fuck alone, so that he could focus on his businesses. Mm-hmm. So they had this like agreement that they could basically be roommates. And as for Madeline, she just wanted the money. She wanted to be taken care of. She wanted to spend as much money as she wanted. She wanted to live this lavish life. And she wanted to have like a good husband that people would be jealous of. And that's what he fucking was. They liked each other a lot. So they had this agreement. They loved each other, but they just weren't about each other, you know. But also Alfred was complicated, too, because he often spent like no woman could just be with him. Like he did not pay any attention to her. He often spent his days just dreaming and daydreaming and thinking and talking about work. It was the only thing that he could think or do or speak. He would come up with endless ideas. He had notebooks on him that were filled to the brim with ideas or I should call this person or da 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 da. And he was on this constant train of thought that only took a break for one thing. And it was definitely not his son. It was definitely not his wife. It was definitely not anything at all other than his only other passion, horses. He fucking loved Loved. horses. Equestrian. He owned a bunch of racehorses, and they were, like, really successful racehorses. And, you know, he had full armas, everything. Oh, bitch. Oh, my God. Yeah. And he he would spend all day. That was the only thing that he would do. It was just relaxing for him. But, you know, this is kind of pretty common with entrepreneurs at Lowenstein's level, though. Like, think about some that we live with in today's society. Like, right. most of the time, if they even have a wife, it's probably a situation like this. Or they've had 13 wives. And then, you know, or they're not married at all. Or husbands and partners and so on and so forth i say that because like if you don't know an entrepreneur i don't think this will make sense and this might even be a hot take but in my opinion like entrepreneurs are artists in their own realm and it's because it's all consuming everything that they see is their art it is Mm -hmm. it becomes a business idea it become and it's something that they can't escape it they almost live these like tortured artist lives that they can't fucking escape it it can't turn off your brain so they end up having the only one thing that they can go to to calm them and for the most part it's not going to be another person because they don't want to hear anybody else speak right so this is again maybe a hot take but just my own experience and my own thoughts in that now on to the case okay so it was the afternoon slash early evening on July 4th, 1928, when Albert Lowenstein's ar- Lowenstein arrives at the Croydon Airport, which was just outside of like modern day London, but at the time Surrey. And this was the only international airport in the UK during the interwar world period interwar period and had only opened up in 1920. So it had only been open for, tw- uh, so for eight years. So this is what? World War One. World War One. Yes. So there, Lowenstein boarded his brand new custom built private Fokker Fokker aircraft Mm -hmm. to make a trip to Brussels with six other people. Not the quiet Fokker. (laughs) I know the Fokker. It's F K K F O K K E R. And I I wish I could explain tell you it's no, it's not it's Fokker. I like Fokker better. Me too, Fokker. But I wish I could tell you the name of it so you could Google it. I'll have a picture on there for you guys. But you know I couldn't be like, it's like when someone's like, it's a Cessna 375 double engine FW64. I'm like, I don't fucking know if that's an I, an L, or a one. I don't know. 
Okay. So he boards his aircraft with his private custom built aircraft with six others. The pilot named Donald Drew, the mechanic named Robert Little, the two stenographers, which were um, two women that would travel with him and they would transcribe everything in shorthand that only they could read with him. So he didn't ha- have a tape recorder on him, I fucking guess. I don't know. But he- they were there to record everything that he said at all times. Named Eileen Clark and Paula Bidelon. And then Lowenstein's private valet that traveled with him everywhere named Fred Baxter. And then his secretary slash like the closest person to him in his entire life, best friend, um, Arthur Hodgson. Hodgson Hodgson and as I said this was a custom brand new plane made just for him to serve as a business office in the fucking sky I love that it was extra soundproof to allow for better conversations of business while flying and so that his stenographers could fucking write down everything so they didn't have to hear this yeah they didn't have to hear they didn't have to hear that you know um but also I want you guys to have a better understanding of the layout because it's really important to the case. So I'm going to walk you guys through it in detail. And there's going to be, I'm, I'm going to try my best to make a diagram, hand drawn again, apologizing to everyone on uh, Instagram. But if if it's not on there, it's because I couldn't post that on there. I'm too embarrassed. And you're just going to have to pay really close attention. Here we go. So let's act like you're standing in the cockpit looking towards the back of the plane. All right. That's where you're at. Okay. Right. Per usual, there's a door that blocks the cockpit from the rest of the plane that has this large partition window on it, allowing the captain, the pilot, the mechanic to see the entirety of the business suite, which is like where if you're in a you know regular plane, all the chairs would be, right? If you walked through the door and into that business suite, that's what I'm going to call it, and continued walking straight back, you would run into a second door that had no window in it. And this door would open up into the into like a hallway. I'm going to call it a foyer, though, because it was just like a little mini foyer. Like, you know what, where you board your planes? Right. That in the back of the plane. You know okay. what I'm talking about? Yeah. And almost immediately to your left, there was a small, thin, window, windowless, <laughs> windowless door. And that is where the restroom was. And then if you took one more step and you like were literally touching the back wall of the plane in this little foyer back hallway to your right, there was a big, huge door that was six foot tall, four foot wide with a small window at eye level only. And it was like a square. I say small because it looks small in the door, but it's like a pretty big window. Like it's the size of your face. You can Mm -hmm. look out of it. And that was the only exit door in this entire plane. Okay. Okay. That's how they entered and that's how they exited. Mm-hmm. And there, like I said, there's only two doors that have windows in it. The one that's in the cockpit and the one at the back that would take you outside. Okay. The other two doors are the one that takes you into that back foyer. And it's a big one. No window. Sounds like they might run into a little bit of a balancing problem. <laughs> when they're getting need on and off. Fucking... You're getting on and off at the back end. <laughs> right. Exactly. Just... You're going to flip fucking backwards. <laughs> um, and you're going to do a fucking wheelie. But then like the laboratory door, like the laboratory to the restroom, you, that's like a typical thin little door. No window. No window in it. Right. Okay. So before taking off, Lowenstein had to run inside to the terminal really cl- quickly because when you have a private airplane like this, you just pull up in your fucking limos and you get right. off. But he is like, I need to run inside really quickly because he had to make a phone call. And he was making this call to Sir Robert Holt, who was a Canadian financial magnet, in order to make their dinner plan to confirm their dinner plans for the following week. After this, he returns to the plane. He makes himself the seventh and final soul on board of the aircraft. So there are now seven people. The doors get shut. That is all that is on this aircraft. Just after 6 p.m., the plane takes off smoothly and begins its flight to Brussels. But they were actually flying to France, right? Okay, I'll I'll get to the actual name of the airport that they were going to. But we know this due to the accounts of several witnesses, in addition to the flight logs, that were gathered to watch this private plane with the third richest man in the world take off. And outside one of the back windows, the only exit... They could see Alfred Lowenstein waving at them as he took off. He's on the back door of the plane. Like yeah, this. back door or maybe the side, like one of the portholes. But they said that they had a perfect view of him. They knew it was him. He was waving, smiling at them as he took off. Third richest man in the world. Okay. 
Right. You would recognize him. So it was just after 6 p.m. when he takes off. Now, uh, according to the four passengers in the business suite with Lowenstein, so it's him and four others, he allegedly chatted with them like a little bit, talked about business and the plans while reading a book until that they until they had crossed over the English Channel coastline. So they had just gotten over and they're now over water at this point. Lowenstein's like, hey, I need to excuse myself to go to the restroom. So he sits down his book. He stands up and he walks to the back of the plane into that back foyer, shuts the door behind him, goes left to go into the toilet. Well, 10, 15 minutes go by and he's not coming out. They're like, that's fucking weird. So I guess his secretary talks to Baxter, who is the val- uh, valet, and he says, hey, will you go check on... Alfred he's been in the bathroom for a long time just make sure everything's good so Baxter the valet goes back there he knocks on the restroom door several times no answer so then he attempts to like jiggle the door to see if it's open and to his surprise it was unlocked so he enters this small fucking plain bathroom the laboratory and there's no sign of him in there at all like nothing not a jacket not a belt buckle not a shoe nothing it didn't even look like he was in there what the fuck he's nowhere to be found on this small fucking private plane of his made custom to him that he designed he had been on it several times too so obviously baxter comes out he pinches secretary arthur h i can't say his last name for some reason today arthur pinches him and he's like yo um bro's gone albert einstein just (laughs) ditched (laughs) he's Glitch. sucked out the toilet like yeah. i don't know what the fuck he's not back there that was my first thought i was like wait i know that's a saying but like did planes like that this i is so maybe stupid me, who but, fucking like, knows did planes like that you said literally get sucked but out like don't toilet. you think that there would have been like a shoe or a belt buckle something. or something or like a hole in the where the toilet was right blood maybe because if it like shredded you to pieces right. toilets aren't that big right like it you would have to there would be blood so Arthur jumps up, searches, because he's basically like, go fuck yourself. You're pulling a trick on me. Goes, looks all over, no sign of Alfred anywhere. I mean, like I said, it's only the business suite, the cockpit, and the bathroom with the back foyer, and the exit door. They're searching all over. They cannot fucking find him. So Arthur, the secretary, writes this little message down on a piece of paper, slides it into the cockpit, and it says, Lowenstein is nowhere to be found. This is passed through the cockpit. Little and Drew get it, which are the mechanic and the pilot. And at this point in the flight, they, like I said, they're already over the English Channel. But they were only five minutes from where they were scheduled to land. So they had just crossed over the the coastline into France because they were going to be landing at the St. Saint, Ingelvere Saint Airport. And instead of landing the plane, because they're only five minutes away from it, at the scheduled location, they do a fucking U-turn in the sky five minutes out and they go back to where they think if he was sucked out of the toilet where he would have gone but then they're also thinking maybe he accidentally opened up that exit door and fell out they would know thinking that he was going to the bathroom so they like fly over the channel really low searching for him they don't see him they don't see him on the beach nothing And instead of just taking the flight 15 extra minutes back to where they just were to land the plane at the airport where they're supposed to land it, the mechanic and the pilot, but specifically Drew, the pilot, lands the airplane at 7.30 p.m., an emergency landing on a beach that was covered in these large sand dunes, like not an easy landing area. Now, what they didn't know about this beach at the time, though, is that... (laughs) It was under French military occupation. Oh, my God. He he. Yeah, you can't land a private unauthorized plane in a military location. Right. And in a weird place where no plane would ever fucking land. You're about to get gun pointed. Yeah. At your face right then and there. So now the six of the original seven passengers exited the plane, stood on the beach and just waited for someone to come get them. Watching all of this go down was French Lieutenant Marquet of the first battalion. French 1st Battalion, and he sent a crew to go arrest those who had just illegally landed on his fucking beach. So he sends a crew out there. They arrest the six passengers, and they're individually taken to be interrogated by this lieutenant. In these interviews, they admitted like that they had lost their employer. He went to the bathroom over the English Channel. They're all like visibly shaken, upset, sweating profusely, teeth chattering, sobbing, screaming, crying. Those are just a few ways that 
Lieutenant Marquet like described how these people were acting. But he also added that he found it extremely odd that it took all of these people 30 fucking minutes for these six people individually to admit to him that it was Alfred Lowenstein. He, they would like not say they were like our boss, our boss fucking jumped out, fell out. We don't know. That's weird. Right. And he was like, this went on for 30 minutes. Unless they were all like PR prepped. I don't know about it. Who knows? Like maybe they signed NDAs or like we're not allowed to talk about anything. So he he then like added on to this that he believed that he believes their stories wholeheartedly as he found it impossible that one could fake the pain and the worry that he was witnessing in them as they were experiencing it. However, Less than 24 hours after all of this, all French inquiries into this investigation and this disappearance in the sky were abandoned because it was not their jurisdiction. And technically, it was no one's jur- jurisdiction as he they determined that he would have fallen out if he accidentally opened that door or was sucked out of the toilet or whatever the fuck happened. Into the channel. Into the international waters, which is why both British and Belgian officials took the same stance they were like we don't have jurisdiction we can't investigate now the only person that was willing to push for an investigation at this point was his wife madeline she was the only one willing to fight for someone to come and help her find her husband but she also had extra motive for this other than just wanting his body found because without a body his will and estate would be locked for four years until he was determined to be dead like oh my god like basically like they what's it called when you um be presumed dead and only that would only be four le- years at least. So yeah. they had to have a fucking body or she was going to get no money at all. No access to anything. But it was also going to be bad for his business partners if that happened because then all of his own holdings Stay and in investments would be fucking locked. And nothing oh, could be changed about them. them. Okay. Yeah. Because he owned that international holdings company. It would, it's a part of his estate. Locked. Holy shit. Right. So this had to be taken care of. No right. fucking question. I mean, this is the third richest person in the world. They had to Holy find his shit. body and no one's willing to investigate. So basically she was going to be broke and all of his partners were going to be fucking losing everything. And can't do anything about it. Obviously, this is not good for her or her son with Alfred. So she basically sets up this massive reward and reaches out to all these countries and is like run this in the paper i'm going to give you the biggest award reward of your entire life if you will find my husband's body any fisherman anybody go find him good for her so she reaches out to the media and the press and she spreads awareness to get this out before his estate gets locked up and she has access to nothing this ends up in some ways backfiring because so many wild conspiracies began to spread because the media was just keeping the story rolling to keep his name out there and let people know that there's a reward but of course they're gonna be digging and here's just an example of a few of the stories that were published allegedly a french fisherman who was out in the english channel witnessed a man parachute down from a plane into the english channel and around the exact time that he landed it would have been the same time that lowenstein went missing but um he lands in the water and a big huge private yacht comes and picks him up and sails away why do i believe it others allege that (laughs) they witnessed a black car drive onto the beach after the plane emergency landed and a man got in and drove off like he was hiding Mm -hmm. and when i mean like this shit went on and on i mean another one is that he never got off the plane or he never got on the plane in the first place because what he actually did was get sneak back into his limousine so he could run off with his mistress who was locked up in an insane asylum and they went and got they eloped Okay, now that one's a little far Like, what the fuck? But why was I already thinking of the first two in my head? Right, so I was I too. am that conspiracy theorist. I mean, yeah, but like... I'm like, yeah, he went in the bathroom see, like, and the, he... The first he two custom built it. So he went up or he went down. He like has a little hatch that he yeah. could get out. He custom built And, you know, that one's plausible to think. He's the third richest person in the world. Right. He could do whatever the fuck he wants. And he and would have people built. after him. Like, who knows? Yeah. So those make sense, but like the runs off with his like a he doesn't like time. he doesn't want to be with women. He doesn't give a fuck. He wants yeah. to be with his fucking horse and with his money. Yeah. Point blank period. That's it. So just some weird ass shit was going on. But okay. So two weeks go by and there were no actual developments other than these crazy ass theories until July 19th. There was a swell that was approximately 10 miles off Cape Grenade. France and a skipper and his best friend were out fishing when they spotted something floating on the top of this swell. 
they go to investigate to find out that it is a badly decomposing body of a man who was wearing only silk underwear, silk socks, shoes, and a watch. They hauled his body on board of their boat and began searching for any identification. And on the inside of the man's watch, they found the name Alfred Lowenstein. They needed to get his body back to shore and call authorities, but he smelled so bad that they could not stomach him being on the deck with them. So they wrapped his body in a tight sail, like super tight, hooked a harness of sorts onto him and threw him overboard once again to drag the body to shore via this like towing technique. Oh my God. Oh my God. But you know what? Like, I can't say that I wouldn't have done the same thing because it's like going to float away. But I mean, I can't even. No, I can't imagine. I can't even imagine what that smells like. I can't. No, we're not going to go there. Once on shore, the family and the proper authorities were contacted and his body was returned home where the family paid for a private autopsy to be performed. And for some reason or another, this took two months, which is very, very long for an autopsy to get a formal report released. But either way, the medical examiner found that Alfred's manner of death was an accidental fall from 4,000 feet. He had a large wound to or incision or wound to his stomach and had broken every single bone in his body. Oh my God. However, his cause of death was technically drowning as water was found inside of his lungs, meaning that he likely went unconscious after hitting the water, but was still breathing and drowned to death. But what's more interesting is that alcohol was found in his system, which was odd to everyone that knew him because he rarely, if honestly, ever drank. He hated drinking. And according to the people on board, he didn't have anything to drink on the plane. And according to everyone that he had been with that day, he didn't drink. Lastly, something that stood out to his wife was the fact that he was allegedly reading a book before going to the bathroom. And he shut the book and he laid it down and he walked to the bathroom. Because according to her and everyone that knew him, friends, family, business partners, who the fuck ever, he thought reading books were the biggest waste of fucking time on the planet. He hated reading. It was a waste of time. And all that to say that obviously there's a lot of inconsistencies going on here with the story. Right. And some of these accidents are literally impossible. Literally impossible accidents. Therefore, there are several theories surrounding Alfred Lowenstein's death. And here they are. Okay. Number one. Let's say it was really an accident. Thinking that he was going to the bathroom, he accidentally opens the exit door and falls to his death. This is supported by the fact that many people did testify that he had become more absent-minded in the recent months and years. In addition to that, during an inquest in Brussels, both of the pilot and the mechanic, so Drew and Little, testified that on their way back home after this whole ordeal when they flew the plane back, they attempted individually going to the back of the plane, letting the other one fly, and opening the door. And each of them said on the both attempts that they made individually, they were able to get this door open. However... Neither of them were under oath at that time, and there were no witnesses. And how does he shut it behind himself? When this was released, thousands of experts from the aviation community came out and said that that was utter bullshit. First off, this had never, ever happened before. Second... These doors looked completely different. The bathroom door versus this exit door. Plus, there's a fucking window at eye right. level. You uh, you walk up, you, you look, see the sky. you see the sky. And then a military inspector came and checked out the plane and the door and everything and found that it was in perfect working order, meaning that it would be virtually impossible for someone to open it mid-flight. Not to mention that if, and I mean if, it were possible for a single man to forcefully open the door, it would 100% have to take two, by the way, like super strong men, by the way. A, the entire plane would feel the pressure change inside and in the cockpit. They would get a warning that the pressure changes was going on in there. And B, it would likely slam shut immediately if if it didn't rip off. It's either that it shuts back and you can't get out or it rips a fuck off. Right. No in between. Alfred, at the time of this, was in no shape to open this door and have the strength to do it because he had chronic rheumatoid arthritis. Yes. 
And it was in a massive flare up at this point in time. Like he could barely open and shut car doors. Yeah, he couldn't do that. He couldn't have done that. So yes, is it possible for two men to open it up? Yeah, but three inches for it slams back. What the fuck? What the fuck? Um, many people, specifically journalists, actually tried this mid-flight on the same type of aircraft, if not the exact aircraft, and could only get the door open three inches before it would slam shut with the help of a second person. Wow. Yeah, there's no way. On that same note, we're going to move on to theory number two, which we will be discussing suicide. So I do want to give you guys a trigger warning. For all of those same reasons, it would be basically impossible for this theory to be true that Alfred had committed suicide. But also, there were no signs indicating that Alfred was looking to end his life. And though there's no such thing as signs when it comes to someone dealing with suicidal ideations or depression or anything like that there doesn't have to be signs it just doesn't add up based on all other evidence about like alfred and his life so i'm just gonna drop that leave it there we're Mm -hmm. gonna move on to the next theory this is that someone on board killed alfred they all did Supporting this is number one, the fact that it would take at least two people to get that door open three inches. Right. Number two, the weird alcohol in his system and the story that he was reading a book. He didn't even bring a book on with him that day. Right. And number three, why not just land at the fucking airport that you're five minutes away from instead of doing a U-turn and flying 15 minutes back? Right. Coming up with to go land on a fucking sand dune beach that's occupied by the fucking French military. Right. Also, according to Robert Little, who was the mechanic on his deathbed, he told his wife that he believed that Lowenstein had been poisoned by someone in the back of the plane, which would have been the two ladies that were his like stenographers. Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Or his secretary slash best friend or his valet. He said that he believed that they had been he had been poisoned by one of those people because just before Alfred got up to go to the restroom, Robert Little, the mechanic who was in the cockpit, looked back through that cockpit window partition door and he saw Alfred taking off his collar, his coat and his tie, making motions as if he was choking or fighting for air, except Going against this, allegedly, Little was the one that was in control of the plane up until the time that they got that note from Arthur, the secretary. So why would he be looking back? How would he be looking back? I don't know what the aviation cockpit right. type shit, you know, development looks like in 1928 on a brand new plane. But I'm assuming it wasn't You probably like, had to pay a lot of attention. You know, you probably had to be looking at where you're fucking going. Right. You know, also Drew was the one who landed the plane on the beach. Adding to, adding to this, neither Drew nor Little, which were the pilot and mechanic, ever radioed for help or made aid reporting that someone had fallen from their fucking aircraft or was missing on flight. Yeah, that's weird. They never once got over the radio and said that. Lastly, why would Little and Drew, the mechanic and pilot, claim that they could easily open that door mid flight? No fucking problem at all. Now, like, why would they say that? Now, let's say that everyone on board was in on this and that they were all involved in this was a murder. What fucking motive would they have to murder him? And why would each of these six people take this to their grave? What would motivate them to murder him? And then all six of them take this to their grave. Money. Many people wonder if they were paid off by the two other stakeholders in that international holdings company that Alfred went into business with. Ooh. Even though it was his company, they were like the only two like big stakeholders in the company. People believe that it was these two mainly for one reason, because just three months after Alfred's death, these two investors came into what is the equivalent today of 200 million dollars holy shit and the recordings on the like transcripts of this business transaction was a quote special transaction on all documents and that was all that it said holy shit other people speculate that, that it was... That sounds like they were paid off, though, and they organized it. Well... By th- somebody else. They speculate than- that they were doing a lot of business with, like, mob mafia type For shit. For sure. For fucking sure. For sure. International sure. Holdings Company. This is like... It should be say fucking ma- mafia runs this shit. 
One hundred percent. A hundred percent. One hundred percent. Um, other people speculate if it was his wife that organized this. That's what I was gonna ask. But she would know that the will would not it without a body, it wouldn't make it sense. It's too risky. And this was gonna be really hard. Like I think if and, it was her, there was this was too risky of a play out. For and her also to lose like the- what what does she care? She has all the money in the world. She has the status of being the third richest person's wife and can do whatever the fuck she I wants. I also would love to know when that will was written or updated. Yeah. To the point where because if he was like, I want everything frozen if yeah. there is no body. Yeah. Until well, I'm some presumed people dead. Said, if he thought that he was going to be, you know, not kidnapped, but yeah. like held hostage or ransom or like anything it, like that or that somebody was... T- he had allegedly had like been in a little bit of a struggle with money, but like how big of a struggle can the third richest person in the world be in with money? Right. But like there was a bad business deal, I guess, that went south that he was like not... Sh- he was stressed about it but not sweating about it you know what i mean like it was probably like a few mil which is nothing to these people see part of me this is my crazy conspiracy theorist going on part of me feels like he hired a look like Mm -hmm. he was going to Mm -hmm. he was going and hiding he was gonna hide a lookalike, which would explain the alcohol. Which would explain the he's two not a months drinker. of the it took to get the autopsy back. It would explain how he had to run back in, make a quick phone call, mm-hmm. and then in comes the lookalike. He's reading a book, so his face is down, so no one on that plane is really noticing what's going on. Like yep. this is like a like a twin lookalike. Like, yep. He's got big money, he can find someone. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. And then this guy gets out of the plane and his body was so decomposed how are they going to recognize and this is in the thir- 20s in the 30s 20, yeah 20 there's no 28. dna testing no dna testing to confirm the only reason that they knew it was him is because that watch just said alfred lonestein inside of it right so there are i mean obviously we could go down rabbit hole after rabbit hole after rabbit hole there's evidence that he's involved with the mafia and with some shady business who wouldn't be when you're at that level like mm-hmm. i'm sure we would be <laughs> sorry we are we are at this level um <laughs> Just kidding. But just like to move money around is really the reason that people would do this and, yeah. you know, whatever, because of the business connection. So do I think that his wife had the motivation to kill him? Absolutely not, because I think she they had this agreement. They she could fuck other people if she wanted to. He right. did not give a fuck. Yeah, he didn't care. But like, I don't think that he would leave his son with nothing left. Like you don't work your whole life like that to just lock it away from your kid who mm-hmm. was a child at that point. I'd also like to see the girls transcripts of that convo on the plane like right before he went to the bathroom like what were they talking about well that's another thing so apparently Robert Little reported who was a mechanic that there were like stacks of notes like his notebooks right that he had been writing down like all this stuff he said that he collected them when they landed on the beach they were never turned over to investigative authorities I don't know if they were given to the family I don't know where the fuck this stuff went really weird and I also feel like the people, I don't know, I feel like the people on the plane probably knew a little bit more than what they're saying. And I think it's so weird that they did land the plane on a private beach, not even knowing that this mm-hmm. was a military, like, yep, um, land. He was worth um, the equivalent in 1920s. It, he was two million pounds, but in today's currency, of well, 2021 currency would have been seven hundred and sixty nine point two million dollars and he was the third richest person in the world that if that doesn't show you now think about the most rich people in the world those are bills bees mm-hmm. blah, 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 blah. think about how greedy yeah capitalism is yeah to make people billionaires when the third richest person in the world was 12 million pounds at that point inflation Holy obviously seven hundreds almost eight hundred million yeah that is a crazy case um and at the time of his death he was 51 years old and let me show you a picture of him how old was his child son um i'm not really sure it was a son i'm not really sure but i think he was younger younger um is he in the fucking mafia or what that is a man on the show peaky blinders so try another image because that is that's his plane let me see that yeah go through these pictures i mean like really though no, guys, they look like Peaky Blinders. You'll see all these pics, but like fucking crazy. Tell me what Robert De Niro's doing. There. I could never open that door, not even on the ground. No, no, you. That fuck. is an iron door, it, and it's locked, dude. It's locked. They don't. You don't just leave a fucking door unlocked in an airplane. That's a whole other thing that we could go down. 
Yeah. My favorite source for this, just because of the visuals I got, was uh, BuzzFeed Unsolved. But uh, Oh, I know they had good There shit. are several, several other like little bitty TV shows and creators that I watched that did it. And I've read There's like- a lot of room to hide underneath there, is yeah, what I'm saying. I know. Because he could have got off on the beach. Why else did they land on that fucking beach? I will not get over that. Yeah. Pilots are trained to literally not panic. Right. So why would this dude panic so fucking hard that he's like, I'm going to land on this bumpy ass beach? Mm-hmm. He wouldn't. He's immediate. He, what you think when you're the pilot? Okay. Yes, this dude, your boss is missing. Right. But uh, number one priority is that we're going to land this fucking plane safely and we'll figure it out. Something's going on here. Something's going on, and I am the captain of this fucking ship. Or maybe he knew that this was a France he military had to have been and he was it. like, I'm kind of scared. Something's going on. I think someone was murdered. I'm well, a lot of people plane. wonder if he was abducted by aliens. I think. That's what also I was thinking glitch in the matrix. A glitch in the matrix. Something. Like he just sits down on the toilet and ends just up like, just falling. Yeah. You know. That's crazy. Yeah. It's just the craziest fucking case in the world. <laughs> like I've never heard anything like that in my life. And just a. You, you can't yeah. open a door on an airplane. And without everybody knowing. It, it ch- hurts especially, your ears. Especially then. Like, yes. This weren't really pressurized cabins. No. Like, this is not like the planes this we have This is a little tiny. It looks like a Cessna. Like, that's right. how, like, tiny this thing is. It looks like a looks bigger like a metal Cessna. box on wheels with... A, Literally. Like, I mean, look at this thing. Yeah, you know? It looks like, like Amelia Earnhardt was in that. Like, that's how old it looks. It's, it's fucking just iron. Yeah. So, I don't... That's a crazy case. Crazy case. And he kind of looks like my dad. No, he looks like someone off Peaky Blinders. He looks like Robert De Niro, who looks <laughs> like my dad. <laughs> like, seriously. Chip, what are you doing up on that Chip, plane? what are you doing? Here's him in his little equestrian fit. Oh, yeah, he is quirky. Yeah. Let me show you. My cats are going crazy downstairs. Let me show you his wife. Did you wife. lock the front door? Yeah, I did. This is his wife. Was that your stomach? That was my stomach absolutely starving i wish you didn't have kava because i could smack mcdonald's chicken nugget right now i was just thinking that oh Stunning. so pretty she's gorgeous here's like a layout of how tiny this fucking plane is. i saw that picture yeah, yeah dude like that's just crazy there's just no way in fucking hell that this happened here's captain drew oh hello captain drew captain drew was mm-hmm. captain drew what yummy doing, yummy buddy? yummy yep i Who's mean that and then top hat that's him alfred lundstein Oh, you know those hats hurt. Yeah, well, they're filled with lead. What are we they fucking Mer- so was it mercury bad. or red? Lead. Red. red. It was the color red. They're red, filled with red forty. They had <laughs> fucking red dye forty all in them. Yeah, that's crazy. But um, in while researching this case, I found so many other just like <gasps> bizarre twisted things that I have to like with famous people like that. Ooh. So it's um, we're we're going down a rabbit hole. Everybody, fucking hold on. I can't wait. I love these kind of stories. Me too. Th- th- these are my favorite. This yeah. is like when I say like I enjoyed listening to true crime. That's the this type of shit it, I'm yeah. talking about. Like that shit. Very sad outcome. Oh my god. Obviously. Very horrific. Obviously, but like the mystery of it. Yeah. How does someone? How does that happen? How, how do six people keep their fucking mouth shut if there was something? Right. That doesn't happen. Unless everyone was knocked the fuck out. That's true. That could be something. They were giving complimentary drinks. The partitions closed on that door. Because you could close that partition. They're doing If they're doing top fucking business shit, they could close. It's a partition window. You could cover it. Yeah, they drug everybody in. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. He says, I'm going to go into a really big meeting. He's like, let me get you a water. Great. There's alcohol mixed in that has like poison it comes back as alcohol sugar because it's glucose it's sugar broken down sugar so not the chemist Me druggist over there becoming a fucking medical examiner <laughs> no idea if that's even true but all I've, right <laughs> i've heard it before that's funny <laughs> we got to go my stomach is <laughs> we hungry we're starving all right we love you guys love you See talk you to you week. next week um, for the crazy dream creepy accounts. We have so many. I can't I'm wait. I'm so fucking excited. All right. We love you guys. Bye. Love you. Bye.